So this morning begins the first in our new message series as we look through the book of Philippians. If you don't mind, just go ahead and take your Bibles out and turn to Philippians 1. You know, Philippians, for a lot of people, it's their favorite book, and for good reason. Philippians is a positive book. It's a very practical book. Uh, In many circles, it's known as the joyful epistle. In fact, joy is one of the most predominant themes throughout this particular book. It's it's not the only theme. In fact, uh, I mean, you'll, you'll hear the word joy over and over and over as we read through this. But there are other themes as well that stand out, uh, like the idea of unity and the idea of humility, self-sacrifice of character. So no matter who you are or what your background is or where you're from, your age, there's something in Philippians for you. It it has a message for every generation. And um, I think there's some things in there that we need to hear. So if you don't mind, turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. Now, before we begin reading, I want to get some preliminaries just out of the way. You'll know immediately that the author is Paul. You remember Paul. If you don't know Paul, Paul's the guy that was on the road to Damascus and he hated Christians. And the Lord Jesus showed up to him and radically changed his life. From that moment on, he, he stopped chasing Christians and began to chase Jesus. And so uh, Paul immediately began going out on mission trips and he went all over the known world there in the Middle East on on missionary trips. And on his second missionary trip, he actually goes to this city called Philippi. And it's at, and, and it's in uh, it's actually the be the first city that he ever goes to in Europe because it's in Greece. And he establishes this church there in Philippi and as Paul's custom is, when he establishes a church, he continues to correspond with that church through letters. And he would send messenger, write a letter and send it with a messenger. And that's how he would continue to keep updated with what was going on in the life of those churches that he planted. This particular letter, though, is unique. He writes it from prison. Yeah, Paul's imprisoned when he writes this. Now, we don't know. There's a lot of debate that goes into where he's in prison at. The most predominant idea is that he's in Rome, but other people question that and say he could have been in in prison in Caesarea Philippi or Ephesus. I like to think that he's probably in prison in Rome because at the very end of the book he said, you know, the time of the decision for what's going to happen to me is drawing near. Um, So there's plenty of debate surrounding where he's at, but the fact is he's in prison. And during his incarceration he had become ill. And this church here in Philippi receives the news that, hey, Paul's in prison, he's ill, and so they decide to act. And they send encouragement to him, and they send him a gift of financial support. And out of all the churches that Paul established, this is the only church that he ever accepts financial support from. He doesn't accept any financial support from Corinth or from Galatia. And that tells us that this church is special. Um, Paul's not just going to be beholden to anybody. But when the the Philippians come beside him and say, hey, we want to help you out, we want to support you, he accepts it. So this is a very intimate letter to the church in Philippi. They have a very special place in his heart, and you'll be able to tell from the tone of the letter. Because when you read through this letter, it's different from all of his other letters to those churches. This letter can, uh, is positive and practical. The other letters that he writes, like to the church at Corinth, the church at Galatia, most of those letters contain a condemnation or a correction or some sort of rebuke. But this letter to Philippi, it's unique. He never criticizes them. He, in, in his other letters, there's these, stop it, don't do this, kick this person out of the church, deal with this. It, but with this letter to the church at Philippi, he doesn't give them any stop it. And this letter is intended specifically for this church 
in Philippi. The other letters that Paul wrote when he would write to Corinth or he would write to Ephesus, those letters were intended to be passed around to other churches in the region to serve as some sort of edification or, or instruction teaching point. But this letter is intended specifically for his friends. It's very intimate. And, and he writes to express and encourage them in their walk with Christ. So if you have your Bibles, Philippians 1, look at verse 1. We'll read down through verse 11. Number, number 1, this church, or this letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. I'm writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the elders and deacons. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. And whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue His work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So it's right that I should feel as I do about all of you. For you have a very special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and I long for you with tender compassion of Christ. I pray that, you lo that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. First thing that I want to bring you back, go back to verse 1. I, I want to point this out. This is, this is so unique in Paul's writings. It's, it's uh, uh, in the day, it was common practice for you as you wrote a letter to somebody that you identified who you are when you're writing the letter. We do it kind of backwards today, don't we? We write this letter, and then at the very end, there's a salutation, and I sign my name, right? This is a different cultural setting. Paul introduces himself right out of the box, which is culturally correct. He says this letter is from Paul and Timothy. So, number one, he's writing to this church. He says this is from Paul, this is from Timothy. It's Timothy's probably writing it. Paul's probably dictating it. And, and they would have known both of them because Timothy was there when Paul helped establish that church. But what isn't normal is the way that Paul introduces himself and identifies himself. He identifies his name. But in all of his other writings, if you'll go through them, if you'll look at the letter to the church at Corinth, he identifies himself as an apostle. And... and that's so, I, you probably think, well, what's the big deal in that? But this is the only letter where Paul does not refer to himself as an apostle. And all of his other ones, he does. Here, he designates himself with the Greek word doulos, which really means servant. Well, more than a servant, it actually means slave. You know, there's a difference between a servant and a slave, right? Right? In this time, a servant enjoys some measure of personal freedom. They can come and go as they please. Oftentimes, a servant would be an employee. They would be paid a wage. They would have their own personal time. They would have their own personal effects. A slave is a much lower position. If you're a slave, you're the property of someone else. You have no rights. You have no privileges. You have no life of your own. You exist for the, for the pleasure of the person that owns you. There's a designation. Paul says here, he says, this letter is from Paul and Timothy. We are slaves of Christ Jesus. There's two things that I want to bring up. And I know you're probably thinking, boy, he's getting really detailed here. But here's, here's the, the significance of this. If he starts this letter by identifying himself as an apostle, what he's actually doing is he's saying, I have authority to tell you these things. He's exerting his authority. It's, it's almost like he's coming out and saying, this is my position. You should respect me. 
You should respect what I'm saying. So he, he, if he identifies himself as an apostle, he's saying, I have the right, the spiritual right, the authority to critique you, to condemn you, to rebuke you. And when he leaves that out, if he omits that title apostle, he's saying, you Philippians, you don't re require any rebuke. There's, I, I don't have any need to establish my spiritual authority over you. This is a different type of letter. But he does call himself a slave. And so what I think he's communicating to his reader there is his humility. He doesn't see himself as a person that, that needs to be recognized in, in, a, in a really uh, organizational manner. He says, I'm humble. I, I see myself as a slave. And it, and it reveals to us his devotion to the Lord. He and Timothy are slaves. They are actually owned by Christ. They are bound over to do His will to the disregard of their own. 1 Corinthians, I don't know if you remember this, but in 1 Corinthians, Paul actually writes to those people in Corinth in chapter 6, and he actually says, you don't own yourselves. You have been bought at a very high price. God paid a very high price for you. See, Paul is communicating that. Here's what I see in myself. I'm just like you. We are slaves. We are devoted to God. So that's the first thing. If you've got your notes there, you might want to write on the back. First thing is that Paul sees himself as a slave. That's how he identifies himself. And he doesn't do it anywhere else. I mean, in, in the book of Romans, he calls himself a slave and an apostle. But here he just says, I'm just a slave. Deep humility. The question I want to answer though this morning is, why is Paul so fond of this church? Why doesn't he critique them? Why doesn't he condemn them? I mean, if you haven't caught on after we read that, I mean, Paul loves this church. He has fond memories of his time living there in Philippi and, and his friends that he made. And he remembers them. And in verse 4 it says he remembers them with bursts of joy. And he thanks God for them. And, and his love for them compels him to pray for them. Why? It says, it, go look at um, verse 5. It says, I make my request for all of you with joy because you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. That's the first reason that he is so fond of this church is that they were his partners in spreading the good news. You see, even though Paul's not with them at this time, this church is still committed to the process. They are still spreading the good news. It's obvious their commitment and their devotion to Christ and the proclamation of the good news has never let up. It's never wavered. It's never caved in. Not even for a moment. These people are rock solid. And he come into the city and he began to share the good news about Jesus and Jesus' sacrifice and how that makes us new and it provides us with a, a, a really great future in heaven. And they buy in. And, and, and they're not only just saying, Yes, this is good news and, and we accept this message. But they're saying, how can we partner with you to make it even more known? You know, in, in Paul's other letters, he, you're going to read about churches who weren't so committed. And, and in those other churches, it seems like the, they, they had cooled off. Maybe they had accepted the message with, with great fanfare. But as time went on, they kind of kind of died off. In some of these churches that he writes to, their leadership made poor decisions. They had disappointed Paul by their behavior. Uh, I, I think when Paul wrote to some of those other churches, he kind of got a knot in his stomach, you know? Just, just kind of, mmm, if I was there, I, you know. 
But not so with the church at Philippi. When he thinks of them, his heart overflows with joy. It's almost like he's saying, I did a good thing there. That, that thing's working out. That's, that's the model. That's, that's what it's supposed to look like. I, I don't think he ever uh, had a nervous stomach or, or was angry or thoughts of angst when he thought of Philippi. He looks back and he says, man, that's a great church. And so he tells them, look at verse 6. And I'm certain that God who began the good work within you will continue His work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. You see, that's what he's telling me. He's saying, your unwavering commitment to Christ is proof that God is doing something great among you. God began the work. I've stepped away. I'm gone. It's not of me. Paul's saying, this isn't my deal. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of the work we've accomplished there. But God began the work. And God is the one who is still working there. And God will continue to work in your lives until Jesus comes back. He's not going to stop until He's finished. Do you ever feel like your spiritual life kind of gets bogged down? That you kind of spin your tires in the mud, or your spiritual journey kind of grinds to a halt, and it feels like you're, you're not making any progress at all? That maybe you accepted Jesus with great fanfare, but it just kind of ooh, feels like you hit a brick wall at some point. God doesn't work that way. He's not going to give up on you. When He starts something, He finishes it. Our spiritual maturity begins on the day we accept Christ as Lord. It's, it's, a, it's a process. It, you are born again. You remember that. Jesus told Nicodemus that. You have to be born again. When you're born again, you create a new life. You're spiritually a child. And for the rest of your life, you will go through the process of maturation. How silly would it be for you to accept the message of Christ and remain a child until the day you die? That's not the way it works. The way it works is you come to Christ, you start a new life, and you begin to mature until the day that Christ calls you home. And on that day that He does that and you stand before Him, that is the point where you are fully mature. God continues to work in your life. And so when you feel dry, when you feel distant, when you feel detached, God is not giving up on you. He'll continue to work through your circumstances and your relationships and, and, and the things that happen on this planet, in this life, through His Word, through His Spirit. And the end goal is that you would be a fully mature Christian on the day He calls you home. Now, I, I do want to say this. This is my own personal commentary here. You can stifle the Holy Spirit. It's like if that fire is raging within you when you come to Christ, you can be a wet blanket to that. You can put that fire out. But don't. It, there's still going to be embers. You don't lose your salvation. But when you feel like you're detached and you're distant and, and that God is so far away, He's not moved. He still has a desire to work in your life. Will you let Him? The end goal is that we would all be presented to Jesus on that final day, fully mature, having everything that we need. Second thing that I want you to see, the re second reason that Paul is so fond of this church is they do things the right way. Uh, you just look at this. The, go, turn it over. To look, we'll look at verse 7. He even says this. So it's right, it's, it's proper for me to feel about you like I do and, and for me to cherish you with a special place in my heart because 
you're generous with the things that God has given you. You're doing things the right way. You're generous with the blessings that God has given you in your life. Paul says, we have shared together the blessings of God. You see, these Philippians, when they hear that Paul is in prison, they immediately set out to try to find some way to encourage him. They take great pains. And, and I think they probably called a committee. Ain't that the way we do it? Probably called a committee. Everybody got together. All right, Paul's in prison. We need to do something to encourage him. And so out of the things that they have, they try and, and, and they create a plan to support Paul. And they do. They support him financially. They send him a gift, a financial gift. Uh, in fact, the letter that we're reading here is in response to the gift that they sent him. So they hear Paul's in prison. They hear that he's ill. They send a financial gift. And Paul is so overwhelmed, he writes this letter in response. But they don't just provide financial support, but they also provide personal support. They have a church member, Epaphroditus. He actually delivers the financial gift and he stays with Paul a while. Can't you imagine that was a blessing to Paul? Languishing in a pit prison somewhere, maybe Rome, we don't know. But not seeing anybody or having any outside contact. If you were in prison at this time, your family was responsible to provide the support for you while you were in prison. It's not like they had cafeterias back then. You were going to eat. Your family had to bring it in to you or you had to make arrangements for it to be provided for you. And that's what the church here does. It's a real personal touch to send Epaphroditus. And so they're all, even though he's not been with them for several years, it's, this letter was probably written 10 years after he established that church. What we see here is they still are assisting him in that ongoing ministry. Whatever it is, wherever he's at, they're a part of it. We do the same thing. We just talked about it. When you give to the Lottie Moon, you're assisting, you're providing, you're, you're joining in, and you're actually doing what it says right there. It says, you're my partners in spreading the good news about Christ. But I want you to see some other thing that they do right. This church loves one another. This is a very diverse church. You may not realize that. Philippi, the city, is on the island or on the isthmus. That's a big word. You didn't know that I knew that, did you? I went to school at Cassville. I got it. This is a very diverse church. They're on the isthmus of Greece. And it's kind of at the crossroads. It's kind of a, a trading route. And... and People would have, from all over the world would have passed through this city. It's kind of a major thoroughfare. And it had a huge market and people selling goods and buying goods and you know, exporting, importing, that type of thing. And so this church is filled with that kind of people. You go back and you read Acts chapter 16. What you'll see is the story of Paul's first visit there. And how he first comes into contact with Lydia, who's a wealthy Asian uh, distributor and merchant of purple cloth. She's very rich. She even owns a house right there in Philippi that, that Paul and Luke and Timothy and Silas, they all kind of VRBO there, or Airbnb, right? Right there in Philippi in Lydia's house. But there's also a little girl that they come into contact with. She's a little Greek girl uh, in, in poverty. And she's enslaved and she's possessed demonically and Paul casts the demon out of her and she comes to Christ. And then, you'll remember the story, Paul's in prison there in Philippi. Earthquake hits. Uh, the, the cages bust open. The jailer's afraid that Paul has escaped and is threatening to kill himself. And Paul then has the opportunity to tell him about Jesus as well. So you have a, a rich, wealthy merchant. You've got this impoverished little Greek girl that, um, that comes out of being possessed by a demon. And then you have this blue-collar, non-religious, non-political, kind of a middle American type guy. 
that Paul has an opportunity and he shares Jesus with him. These are the type of people that make up the church there in Philippi. It's a very diverse group. And so they're from all over the socioeconomic spectrum, but they do not let their differences cause division. They deeply love one another. In fact, Paul says in verse 9, he says, I pray that your love for one another for one another will overflow more and more. He's acknowledging you already love one another. I hope that keeps going on. I hope that I hope it flows out and it pours over and it spills on everyone else. And they're a diverse group. They could find plenty of reasons to segregate and divide up. Start new churches over here. And, you know, this is only churches for people who deal in purple cloth. They don't do that. They stay together and they share in the work. They're unified. They love Paul and Paul loves them for it. So here's where I'll land. I mean, as as I read through this first section of the book of Philippians, I I asked the question to myself. I wonder what Paul, I wonder what he would feel about us. What do you think he would say about us? How would he feel? feel towards us? I mean, would this church, would he give thanks for this church, do you think? Would he he be moved to pray for us positively instead of God call fire down on there? Would, whenever he thought of us, would he be filled with joy? I mean, he felt that way about the church in Philippi, didn't he? They were doing something right. So it tells me, here, here's where I'll just bring it back, land it, let you go. Here's where I would come in. And, and I, I think it should remind us that we are all partners in this together. We're partners together in the gospel. It's, it's not just a missionary's job to tell people about Jesus. It's not just my job to tell people about Jesus. We must all work together to share the gospel with other people. We're partners in this. And if Paul looked at us, would he see us doing that? He says that's one of the things that fills me with joy is because I see you continuing in that partnership with me. Number two thing that I just kind of brought out of all this is that we got to stay focused and on task and not get discouraged. God has started the good work here over 100 years ago. He's going to continue working right here through us today. And we must keep the gospel central in everything we do. God is not beyond taking His hand off of this place. I don't want that to happen. I don't want to be in leadership if that ever happens. So we got to stay focused on our task. And finally, the last thing is we got to continue to do things the right way. Look through everybody that's here. We are a device group as well. We all have different backgrounds. We have different experiences. We all have different occupations, different responsibilities. It's obvious we have different tastes in things like music and preaching styles and food. We've got to make sure that we protect the unity of this church. Even through all those differences and and, and the the potential for distraction and and, uh, being divided. We've got to make sure that we take care of one another. We see someone in need. We need to come alongside them. And we got to dig in to the blessings that God has given to us. And we've got to share those amongst ourselves. We've got to be generous with those blessings. I'm not talking just about dollars, right? I'm talking about time. Time's more valuable than dollars. I'm talking about your acts of service. One of the things that has just overwhelmed me as during my time here is if I have a need you guys are Johnny on the spot to try to meet it. And I'm not talking about financial need. 
you do that well. I'm talking about if, if I have a, a personal need, you guys are there. You're always giving me words of encouragement. I, I don't, you guys say some nice things to me and I don't deserve that. I'm marginal at best. But you treat me like I'm a king. You're doing things the right way. So in the future, squash any div divisive talk. Don't allow it to exist here. Rebuke. Any, anytime someone is acting self-righteous or prideful, rebuke that bad behavior. Not publicly. Don't make, an, don't make a scene of it. Just make sure that we're protecting the unity. Don't do anything to cause conflict or, or dividing lines. Don't split us. If, if, if you're thinking that you need to split, just go somewhere else. Split somewhere else, please. You know? I, I think you kind of boil it all down. Just say, I just love one another without any reservations. Don't be so easily offended. That's one of the things that, that causes more conflict and more divisiveness than anything else is, is that someone's always getting offended about something someone else is always doing. You see it, and it's, it's boiled over into our culture today, and everybody wants to cancel you if you say the wrong thing or look the wrong way or act the wrong thing out. Don't be so easily offended. Don't wear your emotions on your sleeve. Trust that God is in control. And if someone offends you or hurts you, leave it in God's hands. Let God deal with it. But do not bring it in here. And if I ever feel that I'm the lightning rod for that, I'll walk. Because I love you guys too much to allow you to go through something like that. You feel me? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the picture that you've given us through the book of Philippians here in the very first chapter, right out of the box. God, it just reminds us that we're all in this together. And um, we need to love and support one another and need to encourage one another. Father, I pray that we'd always be cognizant of the needs that are among us. I'm, Lord, I admit, I am the world's worst about that. A lot of times it's out of sight, out of mind. But God, I pray that it wouldn't be true of me, that I would be more sensitive to the things that are going on around me. Lord, I always be mindful to pray for my people. Lord, I, that they, they cause me to overflow with joy whenever I think of them. Fond memories. And so, Father, I just pray that um, as we walk away from this place this morning, that you have somehow supernaturally, super spiritually, you have forged an even stronger bond between your people here that that our chains are even tighter than they've ever been. We're all in this together, all for the glory of your name. Jesus Christ, Savior of my soul, lover of all of us, amen. We stand to your feet. Hi, thank you for watching. If you'd like to see more content like this, like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure to click the little bell to be notified every time we upload a new video. You see, our goal here at Arnhart is to make biblical, God-centered teaching available for everyone, regardless if they're able to be in person with us or not. If you'd like to join us live, go over to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Arnhart Baptist Church and join us for service Sundays at 1045 a.m. If you'd like more information about our church, visit our website at arnhart.org. As always, we love you and hope to see you next week.